Welcome to another astronomy lecture. Last time we talked about the sun. That was mostly about the kind of outer layers of the sun, the sun's atmosphere. This lecture, we're still talking about the sun, uh, but we're going to talk a bit more about what's going on in the interior. Well, there it is. It's a nice little sunrise, sunset. It's hard to say. Okay. But that's our sun. And as you know, you stand outside in the sunlight, it starts to heat up your skin. Right? The sun is outputting a bunch of energy. You can feel that when you just stand outside. That though is just the energy that's landing on this little spot. Remember, and we're a long ways away from the sun. In order for there to be that much energy right here, go all the way to the sun, think about the whole surface of it, it's outputting an insane amount of energy. And it's been doing that for billions of years, like four and a half billion years or so. And as far as we can tell, it's going to continue to do that for at least four or five billion more years. Uh, the book mentions some older thoughts about how the sun put out so much energy, how it managed to generate so much energy for so long a time. I'm not going to go into much detail of any of those, only to say that it's not just a normal burning like bundle of wood, right? or like a big chunk of coal that's just on fire, just burning up. Because if it was just a big old chunk of like coal that's combusting, it would have burned out a long time ago. It wouldn't even have made it to a billion years. It's like a couple hundred million years or something it would have taken to burn through a chunk of coal about the size of the sun. So it's not a normal sort of burning thing like we are more familiar with on Earth. In order to understand how it manages to put out so much energy for so long, we got to think about where is energy coming from? And what is energy in general? So we're going to take a little bit of a detour and talking maybe slightly more about just physics kind of stuff for a second, or having to do with energy, in order to better understand how the sun has burned for so long and will continue to burn for much longer. So when somebody says energy, or particularly when somebody in science, a scientist says energy, there are very particular kinds of things that they're talking about. And broadly speaking, there's sort of two classes of energy. One is what you can think of as like stored energy, or what we call potential energy. The other has to do with motion, movement of objects and masses. That's what you call uh, kinetic energy. Kinetic just means motion. The energy of motion, pretty straightforward. Something's moving, it has energy. And you can understand like how much energy it has by sort of the impact it might make. Like a ping pong ball, if it was just thrown at you, hits you, now not really much of anything. Right? Somebody's tossing it at you. It's going pretty slowly. It's in motion, but that's not a lot of motion. It's not very intense motion. However, if you've ever seen ping pong balls being fired at high rates, um, you get up to 100 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, 1,000 miles an hour, if that thing hits you, it's going to do serious damage because it has a lot of energy. So that's just the energy of motion. The stored energy or potential energy is a little bit trickier because it sort of comes in a lot of different varieties. We have things like electrical energy, or gravitational energy, elastic energy, chemical energy, and finally mass energy. So the last one I put in there, it's going to be very important for understanding how the sun works. So here I just tried to give you some examples of different kinds of energy. And broadly speaking, we tend to really notice energy when it's converted from one form to another. Right? So when like uh, chemical energy is converted into kinetic energy, or the energy of motion. So an example of that would be when gasoline gets burned up in order to propel a car forward. A bunch of gasoline, it's like a storage of chemical energy, you convert that by burning it in order to turn piston, or to push pistons, to turn axles and such to move the car forward. Uh, the other one here I have is an example of elastic energy. So like a slingshot, or maybe you can think about just like a rubber band. If you stretch a rubber band, and or such a slingshot, and then release it, what you've done is you've built up some elastic potential energy, some stored elastic potential energy. When you release that uh, band, then that stored energy gets converted to kinetic energy. And in fact, in order to create that elastic energy, you are utilizing and converting some chemical energy from your body into that elastic energy. Right? It's your muscles that are contracting to pull that uh, band back. The muscles are burning certain sense are using up chemical energy that's stored in them in order to contract and do that. So there's even chemical energy being converted to elastic energy. Finally, I have an example of a trebuchet, which converts 
gravitational energy to kinetic energy. So by lifting up a very heavy object, or any object really, but you lift up an object, you're actually giving it gravitational energy. You hook it up to this contraption in a certain way, once you release that object, that gravitational energy converts to the kinetic energy to send the ball flying, right, to cause that motion. So this is all just to hopefully give you an idea of things to like think of when we say energy, right? There's a bunch of different kinds of store energy, really just one kind of energy of motion. I wanted to make a quick note that if you are reading along in the textbook, the text gives an interesting analogy to wealth as understanding energy and saying how energy comes in different forms, just like wealth comes in different forms. And it's sort of unfortunate, they are only considering what we call monetary wealth. They have like real estate and cash and debt, and, right? All this financial sort of stuff. Would have been nice if they would have taken the more broader concept of wealth to things like, well, there's monetary wealth. There is sort of a wealth of influence. There is what you might call spiritual wealth or well-being, mental wealth, well-being, and so there's other kinds of wealth. And I sort of feel compelled to point out that it can be a bit of a problem when we confuse monetary wealth with all wealth. We seem to have a bit of an issue with that. As I have up here, mass, initially or a long time ago, for a long time, was thought to be made up of just these teeny tiny little building blocks that were called atoms. And this idea of a sort of building block, almost like Legos, right, where you have really, really tiny little things and you put a bunch of them together, eventually you can build up a person, or like an apple, or the earth, right? But there's just tiny little indestructible things you put together to build up bigger things. So this idea has been around for a few thousand years at least, and what the fact the atom exactly was has evolved over that time, uh, but that's the idea of and atom, broadly speaking, is just this really tiny little thing that builds up all the stuff that we see. Until about a hundred years ago or so, physicists and anybody interested in atoms was still looking for what are these building blocks? What are the simplest things? We kept like pulling matter apart, pulling it apart, pulling it apart, pulling it apart, getting smaller and smaller pieces to still look for what is the smallest thing that everything else is going to be built up of? Or what are the few smallest things that everything's built up of? Well, uh, but we had a bit of a shock and have had to change our thinking about that whole process due to what is now termed quantum physics and the theory of relativity. These two theories in physics fundamentally shift how we look at what matter is made up of. It's only been about a hundred years or so since they kind of started to come about and so that paradigm shift really hasn't taken a hold in the general population eventually, hopefully. So one of the outcomes of these new physical theories was to say that matter is actually just a form of energy. So the thing that we thought was built up of these tiny indestructible blocks is really just another form of energy and it's stored up in those teeny tiny little spaces. So it's not made up of these building blocks and in fact matter, like thing like a really really small bit of matter like an electron or a proton or even smaller than a proton, is actually more akin to notes that are played on an instrument. So when you play an instrument such as a violin, you're hitting certain frequencies, certain resonant frequencies of that string. And in fact, on the violin, it's even particularly difficult to hit the right notes because there's no frets on there. There's nowhere to tell you where to put your fingers. So you have to learn or to kind of know where those positions are. And so when you don't hit those positions, you don't make these pure notes or these really nice sounding notes. It's like a bunch of scattered things. Right? But when you do hit just that right position, you're generally making a very pure sort of frequency, right? at least for some of the notes that you're hitting. Right? You hit a one note and you just hear that one sound. So that sort of pure note, that like resonance of the string, that's actually more like what matter is. It's a tough thing to take in at first, but maybe you'll get it. So that leads us to this equation, E equals MC squared. Probably the most famous equation in physics, at least most widely known in the broad population, or known of at least. But basically this equation is a conversion between mass, or matter, and energy. And the conversion factor is c squared. It's the speed of light squared. So c is just a variable that stands in for the speed of light. And if you recall, the speed of light was 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. It's a very, very large number. 
Right? And what that means for this conversion is that a little bit of mass gets multiplied by a very big number that's squared. You have a very big number you square, you get a really big number. Take a tiny little bit of mass, multiply by that number, huge amount of energy. So matter is energy is kind of bundled up um, into this tiny little form, and it's a ton of energy that gets bundled up, right, into every little bit of mass. To give you examples of some other conversions, you might be more used to, right? If you want to convert miles to feet, well, however many miles it is, you multiply by 5,280. That tells you how many feet that is. Or if you want to convert tons to ounces, multiply by 32,000. If you want to convert liters to milliliters, you multiply by 1,000. So it's the same idea. You're converting mass to energy. That equation, E equals mc squared, is telling you how much mass is equivalent to how much energy. Just like how many liters is equivalent to how many milliliters, or how many miles is equivalent to how many feet. So given that the speed of light is so large, it turns out that one gram of mass, if you convert it purely to energy, it turns out to be the same, or roughly the same, as burning 15,000 barrels of oil. So one gram is like the size of a pea, or like uh, the weight, the same amount of mass as like a paper clip, right? If you're able to convert all that mass to energy, or release all the energy that's bound up in that mass, you get about 15,000 barrels of oil there burned. So it's a lot of energy in any tiny amount of mass. I'll just say that I kind of stuck in there a indication of why the metric system is better than the standard system of units we use here. So mass is equivalent to energy, right? And a little tiny bit of mass could be released as a ton of energy. E equals mc squared. It tells us how much energy, but doesn't really say how mass could be converted to energy, like practically speaking. How do you do that? Because right? for the most part, like, this is matter, I'm made up of matter, right? Doesn't seem like just hitting it turns it into energy. I mean, maybe it really, really, really hard, but I can't hit that hard. No, we can't. So the way that mass is converted to energy is through a couple of different processes, which we call nuclear processes. So these are the three types here of nuclear processes. One is uh, nuclear decay. And that is basically just the spontaneous breakdown of the nucleus of an atom. So we talked a little bit about the structure of atoms, I think, in the first or the second lecture. But just to say, again, that the nucleus of the atom is where the protons and neutrons uh, live. Right? And then electrons are somewhere outside of that. Right? But in the nucleus, it's like the core of the atom. Really, really tiny, compact thing. Protons and neutrons. Nuclear decay, then, is when the protons and neutrons just spontaneously, randomly, just kind of fall apart, break apart in some way. As shown here, a small sort of chunk comes out of the nucleus that started until we get the nucleus to the end with, and this small chunk that gets taken out. That is actually uranium-238. So this is uranium decaying to thorium and helium, or an alpha particle. You don't need to know that part. I just want to point it out. Okay, the next nuclear process would be nuclear fission. So it's also a breakup of a nucleus, but this is a stimulated breakup, meaning it's being forced in some way. And that typically takes the form of a neutron or some other very small nucleus hitting a larger nucleus. Right? So in this picture here, you got that little green uh, particle kind of coming up to a much larger nucleus. Probably think about maybe like a neutron that's flying at this nucleus, and it breaks it apart in these chunks. Big chunks, and then there's some, usually some other smaller chunks but it's a stimulated breakdown of the nucleus. This process is actually what's being used in nuclear reactors in order to uh, generate energy from nuclear um, processes. What we'd like to use to generate energy, though, is fusion. Right? So the last nuclear process we call it nuclear fusion. And as the name indicates, you're fusing nuclei together. Or at the smallest scale, you're fusing like protons together. One proton, one proton can come together. This is a combination of nuclei. And shown here are some helium nucleuses that are fusing together to form a single helium nucleus with two neutrons there and then two other protons leaving. That's the nucleus of a hydrogen atom, just one proton. One proton here, one proton here. So in each of these processes, energy is released. And for the most part, it also takes energy to cause them to happen, right? Some kind of kinetic energy of that incoming particle and fission in order to break, to smack the nucleus and break it apart 
there's this like energy of motion of these two nuclei coming together to fuse. Fusion is the one that powers our sun. So the sun's not a big ball of burning coal, it is in fact a big ball of fusing protons, or hydrogen nuclei. So thinking about the process of nuclear fusion, pushing nuclei together to bind them together, well the simplest kind of version of that is you take one proton, you take another proton, and you think about smash them together, right? Stick them together. There's an issue, and partly why it was hard to understand how that happens. For a long time, we only knew about a couple of forces in the universe. There's a gravitational force between massive objects. There's also electrical forces between electrically charged objects. So I told you the proton has a positive electrical charge. And as a consequence, if you try to push two protons together, they're light charges, they're both positively charged, so the electrical force is going to want to push them apart. So you can try to force them together, but the electrical force is going to push back. And the closer they get together, the stronger that electrical force is going to push back. So how is it possible that we can stick two protons together? Or what is it that would hold them together? It turns out that there is actually other forces beyond electrical and gravitational. One of them is what we now call the strong nuclear force. And it was only first proposed in like the 1970s, but it's responsible for holding protons and neutrons together in the nucleus of atoms. Unfortunately, it is quite complicated, mathematically at least. Easily the most complicated of all the forces we know of, the four forces we know of. So just to say, on a very sort of simple level, the strong force is something that only really comes into play when things are incredibly close together. Something like 10 to the minus 15th meters. That's like a millionth, billionth of a meter. A millionth of a billionth of a meter. Which is roughly the size of most nuclei. Right? So it only really affects things when protons and neutrons get close enough together to be like touching almost. But once they are close enough together, the strong force becomes incredibly strong. That's why it's called a strong force. In that scale, it is the strongest force that there is. And so if you can get two protons close enough together, Right? You're overcoming that electrical force, and it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. It's getting harder and harder to push them together. But you get them close enough, all of a sudden the strong force takes over and pulls them together. It sort of overcomes the electrical repulsion then. In most normal situations, if you just have protons hanging about, they never get close enough to actually get to that point where the strong force is going to take over and bind them together. Right? Because it takes so much effort to overcome that electrical force until they're close enough for the strong force takes over. Okay. That's normal conditions. However, in the core of stars, like our sun, and our sun in particular here, the temperatures and the densities are so incredible that protons often do get close enough together in order for that strong force to start acting. So the temperatures we're talking about are like 12 million Kelvin. It's hard to imagine how hot that is. It is very, very hot. Right? And this is incredible densities too. Right? 150 grams per cubic centimeter. If you recall, we were talking about planets and asteroids and such, we looked at densities. Most of those densities were like one gram per cubic centimeter, maybe like three, four, five grams per cubic centimeter. And water is actually one gram per cubic centimeter, that's its density. So in the core, or inside, in the interior of the sun, densities reach 150 times that of water. Which maybe doesn't seem like a whole lot, but if you Imagine trying to like take a bottle full of water and squeeze it, right? If you compress it at all, then you can increase the density, right? But squeeze that as hard as you can, you're barely gonna condense that at all, right? There's almost no change in its density as hard as you can squeeze that. And in any normal situation, water is basically incompressible. But if you were to take a sphere sort of of water and you're able to condense it 150 times, right? So something like this big, you might have to condense it down to a size like this, maybe something like that. Just to try to give you some idea of how dense things are in the core of the sun. So one other important aspect of nuclear processes, and in particular we're talking about fusion, we're just going to think about protons using for now, but you know it could be larger things that are getting pushed together. If you can imagine having two protons that are separated, right? They're not bound together by the strong force, they have fused together. Take them separately and weigh them, they weigh a certain amount. The strange thing though is when you take those two protons and you 
push them together, fuse them together, you form this combined new nucleus of two protons. The two protons together actually weigh a bit less than the two protons separated. So like if you could take two protons that were fused together, put them on one side of a scale, and two protons that are separated, and then on the other side, the separated ones would weigh a little bit more. Right? Pull down there. What was happening there is that when the protons fuse together, there's some small amount of mass that gets converted into energy and then sort of leaves that fusion process. And that's what we call binding energy. And I just wanted to point out right now, I'll come back later, that like how stable a nucleus is, right? like how strongly uh, bound together it is, can be measured by the amount of binding energy that was released to put them all together. Right? So more and more binding energy release putting this nucleus together, the more stable that nucleus is. And it turns out that iron is the most stable of all the nuclei. It releases the most energy putting that iron nucleus together. So this will come back around when we talk more about the sort of lifetime and death of stars later on. All right, so we've been talking about nuclei and atom and such for a little bit. I thought it'd be good to recall sort of the main players in the nucleus, and particularly the main players in nuclear processes. There are other things, but these are sort of the main ones, especially that we're going to concern ourselves with. So we got the proton and the neutron. Those are nuclei. They make up the nucleus of an atom. And you got the electron, makes up sort of the outside cloud orbiting around the nucleus. And then we have this thing called a neutrino, which I don't think I've mentioned before, but it is going to be in some of the pictures you see, so I wanted to at least mention it. And I want to note that besides these particles, there are also antiversions of each of these things, also called antimatter. The antiparticles are the same as the regular particles in all ways, except for the electrical charge. So an antiproton weighs the same amount as the regular proton. All the other properties are the same, except that it has a charge of minus one, whereas the proton has that plus one. Right? One positive charge. Antiproton, one minus charge. Antielectron, all the same properties as the electron, except it has a positive charge, where the electron has a negative charge. And the antielectron is so special that it's got its own little nickname, which we call a positron. So, just to keep in mind, maybe the charges here, right? Proton is positive, electron is negative, the neutron and the neutrino both don't have any charge, electrical charge. And the masses are on there in kilograms. I think the table in the book just has the kilograms. I thought maybe also be nice to put in how each of them, or how massive each one of them is in relation to the electron. It turns out that the proton and the neutron are both about 2,000 times the mass of the electron. And the neutrino, well, it's really tiny, and we don't actually know. We have some sort of limits on how big it is, and we know that it's really small. And yeah, there's a lot hidden in that last row. Well, unfortunately, we don't really have the time to go into all that. So now we maybe know a little bit more about fusion, and I told you that is the process that's powering our sun. Beyond that, to be even more detailed, there's a particular chain of fusion processes that occur in our sun and that generates most of the energy that our sun outputs. And that's what we call the proton-proton chain. So the images here, actually on the left and the right, are showing the same process. So it's a pretty simple process. I mean, there's a lot of little things going on there, but there's only three steps really to this process. Right? In step one, you have two protons or hydrogen nuclei. Hydrogen is just one proton and an electron, so if you take that electron away, it's just a proton. So those one H's are just protons, as I indicated in the legend down here. So the first step, take two protons, smash them together, fuse them together. What you get out is still hydrogen because one of those protons converts into a neutron in that process, and also out of that process you get a neutrino and a positron, or an anti-electron. The second step in that process is another proton coming along and smashing into the output of that first process, that proton and neutron together, right? H2, proton and neutron stuck together. So that H2 gets smashed into by another proton, you have another fusion happening, and out of that, there's no conversion between proton and neutron. We just have two protons and a neutron together now. And also we get a gamma ray out. So high energy uh, electromagnetic radiation. The last step in that process then is two of these helium-3 nuclei, two protons, one neutron, 
two of those that have been created throughout this process smash together, fuse together, another fusion process. Finally, we form helium-4, which is two protons, helium, and then two neutrons. This is a standard and most stable type of helium. So you get that helium nuclei out, you also get two protons out. But now we finally have a stable nucleus. Right? Each of these in-between ones, hydrogen-2, helium-3, not stable. In the third process, we finally get out this helium-4, standard sort of helium, and it's stable. So that's showing sort of the individual steps in the process. This picture over on the right here is illuminating the fact that there actually needs to be sort of two of these processes happening at once in order to end up with that final helium-4 nucleus, that final stable nucleus. Because in the last step of the process, you recall I said we needed two of those helium-3 nuclei. It's two protons and one neutron. We need two of them. So we actually have to have had step one and two happening twice, right? One of them happening, another one happening to form two of these helium-3 nuclei, which can then fuse together to form, finally, our stable helium. So as I mentioned, out of each of these processes, energy is generated, and partly what powers or supplies all the energy that the sun has been putting out for billions of years. Smashing protons together, smashing slightly larger things together to finally form helium. This is not the only fusion process that happens in the sun. This is just by far the most dominant one in our sun. In other stars, there are other fusion cycles. One is called the CNO cycle, which involves carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. Um, we'll talk about that later when we talk about um, other kinds of stars. Hopefully, you at least accept that out of those fusion processes, we're getting sort of energy overall. But you might have been wondering, or might be thinking, the sun is putting out energy as like light, right? There's a lot of visible light and also ultraviolet light it's coming out of the sun, right? Where does that come from? Well, for one, in the second step of the process, you remember I said there was this gamma ray that was released, which is an electromagnetic radiation, high energy electromagnetic radiation. So there's some light right there. It's just very high energy, right? Much shorter wavelengths than visible. And it turns out that eventually that gamma ray is probably going to leave the sun's surface as like a UV or a visible photon. I should say that I might use the term photon, I don't know if I've used it before, but it's a term that just refers to like sort of like a piece of light or like a chunk of light. So I could say that's a gamma ray, which is a kind of electromagnetic radiation. I could also say it's a gamma ray photon. So photon is just saying like a kind of like a piece of light moving along. So that's one place where light is eventually generated, visible light. Another place that we actually end up getting light out of this process is thinking back to the first step, I said there was this positron that was released, or an anti-electron. I didn't mention this before when I was talking about antiparticles or antimatter, but one of it, the properties of antimatter is that when it meets regular matter, its regular matter counterpart, this process called annihilation happens. It basically just blows up and for the most part turns into high energy gamma rays. Gamma ray photons, if you will. So this positron is being released, this anti-electron. There's a bunch of electrons also floating around in the core of the sun. So that positron is pretty quickly going to meet an uh, electron, its matter counterpart, and annihilate, and we get two gamma rays out of that. So one gamma ray here, two gamma rays here. But if you recall, in each chain, each proton-proton chain, there's actually these things happening twice. And so overall, you get six gamma rays out of one proton-proton chain process. And that's basically where all the light ends up coming from that we see, right? There's a bunch of these processes happening all the time, and these gamma rays get formed more in the core of the sun, and they got to get out of the sun. And so it takes a while, and eventually they leave the surface. Generally, it's visible light or ultraviolet light. So how does a very high-energy photon, like a gamma ray, turn into, like, visible light, much lower energy, much longer wavelength than a gamma ray. Well, like I said, it's super dense in the core of the sun. So when those gamma rays first get created, they're shooting off in whatever direction, but right away they start running into things, right? There's all kinds of stuff and they're really, really close together. And so in the upper image on the left, that squiggly line is like our gamma ray and it just left its fusion process, just got created, it's leaving, it's trying to go to the outside of the sun, it runs into something right away gets absorbed, re-emitted. 
then moves off in a different direction. And it just goes up and it hits something else, right? You can think about it as like bouncing off of it. And it's going to keep doing this, right? It's going to keep bouncing around. It's going to try to keep going straight, hit something else, keep going, hit something else, keep going, hit something else, keep going, hit something else. And you see it goes in all these different directions. And you can think about the energy of that photon. It starts out as that gamma ray energy, or that really high energy uh, gamma ray. It is slowly being dissipated as it hits all these different things trying to move through the sun. And it's actually similar to how a ball will lose energy as it bounces. You take a bouncy ball, toss it in front of you, it's going to bounce, and it'll bounce pretty high the first time, bounce a little bit less, bounce a little bit less, just like the animation there, right? So it's losing energy on each of these bounces. A similar thing is happening with these gamma rays, right? They're first created, they're very high energy gamma rays, but on each bounce, they might lose a little bit of energy. Eventually that gamma ray will lose enough energy when now it's in the X-ray portion of the spectrum, keep losing energy, keep losing energy, it's now in like the ultraviolet, or maybe like the extreme ultraviolet close to X-ray, keep losing energy, ultraviolet, and it might eventually make it out of the sun as an ultraviolet photon, right? Or it might keep smacking around, it hasn't made it to the surface yet, it will lose more energy until it finally becomes like a visible photon, and then maybe it finally made it to the surface, and it keeps going, there's nothing else for it to smash into, it can just come towards us and we get to see it. So we see the sun. The image on the bottom right is kind of depicting that process where a photon gets created towards the center of the sun, right? This like gamma ray photon, really high energy electromagnetic radiation, and just keeps smacking around, right? Let's do this random sort of path, losing energy as it goes. Eventually, it finally happens to end up at the surface of the sun and it can finally leave. There's not really much blocking its way anymore. How long does that photon that was created in the core of the sun take to get out? A surprisingly long time is the answer. We don't really know exactly. I guess I should have pointed out a little while ago. We have pretty good ideas of how the interior of the sun works, but it's still very tough to model it accurately. We're still working on that, I guess. We think it takes somewhere between 100,000 years and a million years for a photon that starts out as a gamma ray photon in the center of the sun to make it to the edge of the sun. Once it leaves the edge of the sun, it takes about nine minutes to get to us. So it could be that some of the light you see from the sun now was first generated in its core a million years ago. Crazy. We talked about neutrinos a little bit, and just wanted to point out that unlike the photon, it's electromagnetic radiation, and unlike an electron and a proton, the neutrino doesn't interact with other things via the electrical force. It also doesn't interact via the strong force. It only interacts with other matter through what we call the weak force, or the weak nuclear force. It's called weak because it's very, very weak relative to the other ones. And beyond that, the amount that the neutrino will interact with other matter is incredibly small. So much so that a neutrino that gets created toward the center of the sun, right, in that first step in the proton-proton chain, can just zoom right out of the sun. It doesn't interact with anything as it moves along. Or like it doesn't hit anything. Because in order to hit something, it needs to interact with it somehow. And that's through some force. And it barely interacts with anything at all. Neutrinos are actually streaming through us all the time. Many from the sun, but some from other places too. And they also will pass through you. They'll pass through the entire Earth and not touch a thing. It's almost like a kind of ghostly particle. Barely know it's there. It is there. So we'll talk a little bit more about neutrinos towards the end. For now, though, We've talked about the process that generates the energy inside of the sun. It's fusion, for the most part fusion of protons and protons, and then uh, slightly larger nuclei to form helium. But as I told you before, the sun is basically a really big ball of very, very hot gas. Now you know it's also like a huge nuclear reactor in the core too, but it's still basically really, really hot gas. A gas has a certain pressure associated with it. And you can think about the pressure of a gas by like imagining this bit of gas, like on the left there, that's enclosed in this sort of cube. And the pressure that that gas has, we can think of as the sort of force, or like the impacts that those gas molecules, or gas or atoms, are making on the edge of that box. So there's a ton of these gas molecules or atoms just floating around, and they're stuck in this box, and they keep hitting the side of this box, bouncing going the other way, bouncing going the other way, bouncing going the other way. 
And so the overall, the amount of sort of impacts and force that is being applied over that surface of the box is what we say is the pressure of the gas. And you can really feel pressure of a gas yourself by just taking some kind of container that's airtight, maybe like a bag that you just seal up with some air in it, and you try to squeeze it. For one, in closing that air in it, it still stays uh, pushed out, right? It doesn't just collapse. And that's gas pressure, that's pressure of that air already that's keeping that to have a shape, it's still holding a shape like that. You can increase that pressure and you can feel it a lot more if you try to squeeze that bag. You know, squeeze it, start to feel the pressure increase because you're condensing all this gas, increasing, and you feel the pressure, it stops you from pushing it even further together. So in general, the pressure of a gas doesn't need to be involved with any sort of container. It could just be impacting a larger volume of gas around it. It's just gas pressure. It's a nice little animation showing the impact of like atoms and a gas against this container. So why do we care about this? Well, gas pressure is actually what is keeping the sun from collapsing in on itself. So our star has been around for billions of years. It's going to be around for billions of years more. It stays about the same size. One way to say all that together is just to say that it is a stable star. Right? It's not collapsing, it's not expanding, and it's generally been putting out about the same amount of energy for a long, long time. If you think back to when I told you about the formation of the solar system, right? it was this collapse of this dust cloud, this solar nebula, and a lot of that dust ends up collapsing in the center, which forms our star, the sun. So gravity is pulling all of that material together, all that matter together, and trying to crush it. It wants to pull all matter as close together as it can. Luckily though, there is this thing called gas pressure, right? Gas will exert, and just like trying to squeeze that bag of air, it gets harder and harder to compress it the more you squeeze it together. Same idea here. All of the gas that's getting squished together to form the sun, eventually its pressure is enough that it balances out the force of gravity. So gravity is trying to push all of this gas together, but it has a large enough pressure that it pushes back out, right? And we get this stable situation where everywhere inside of the sun, there's sort of this balance of gravity pushing in, gas pressure pushing out. This balance has a term, we call it hydrostatic equilibrium. All right, so there's all this fusion going on in the core of the sun, generating all this energy, photons, gamma rays, the temperature in the core is something like 12 million degrees Kelvin. It's huge density, crazy densities. But all of that energy wants to get out of the core. It's sort of like if you have like a baked potato. Put it in the oven for a long time, the whole thing's really hot all the way through, and you just set it out. That potato is going to just slowly cool off. It's going to want to release that energy, right? So we say that heat is being released from the potato. And the outer stuff is right next to the air, and so it's able to release that energy a little bit quicker. The interior of the potato is going to stay hot for longer because it has a harder time releasing that uh, heat, right? And transferring that heat from the inside all the way to the outside and into the air. The sun has a similar kind of thing. It is very, very hot in the interior and it wants to release that heat towards the exterior. Get it out somehow. How does it do that? Well, when it comes to heat and what we call a heat transfer, there's really only three kinds of heat transfer. Three ways that heat gets moved from one place to another. One of those is called radiative heat, or the heat of radiation. And an example of radiative heat transfer is like a toaster. When you turn on a toaster, the coils get so hot that they glow. Right? And that glow is actually partly because it's emitting a lot of infrared radiation. It's electromagnetic radiation, it's a little bit longer wavelength than red. Right? Infrared is just a little bit longer than red light. It's emitting this infrared like photons. That's how heat is transferred radiatively. In that case, it would be between the coils and like the piece of bread in there. In the interior, and particularly in the core, and in most of the interior, a lot, large portion of the center of the sun, it's radiation that's transferring most of the heat. Right? So that's like all those gamma rays that are created throughout the fusion chain are moving most of that energy from the core. And that's why we call the interior of the sun, the very interior, the centerish of the sun, the radiation zone. So that's the kind of way that heat is being transferred in that zone. Once you get out of that, we hit the convection zone. So that's where heat is being transferred via convection. I may have mentioned this before, but heat transfer by convection, 
good example of that is like a simmering soup. In that process, you're heating up the bottom of the container that the soup is in. And so the bottom of that container is getting really hot and it's transferring directly to the um, soup that's sitting at the bottom. And as that soup heats up, it gets hotter, it's expanding, and it wants to rise. So that rising of the really hot soup at the bottom and then mixing sort of with the soup higher up that's a little cooler, that's convection. So it's sort of this movement of hotter material through colder material that uh, disperses that heat. Really hot here, moves up, lets that heat kind of mix around with the surrounding soup, eventually cools down, will move down to the bottom and get heated up, expand, and then water come up, and it'll mix with the other cooler stuff above. Hit now, cool off, more convective heat transfer. So in that zone, the sort of like mantle of the sun, the convection is dominating the heat transfer. So radiation has taken the heat mostly out from the core, but now it's mostly convection. It's mostly like currents. So like big masses of material are absorbing all that heat from the radiation zone and getting heated up, and then kind of going to expand and rise up. So that heated material rises up and it cools as it gets towards the outer edge of the sun. As it's cool enough, it starts to fall down again, rise up, and it's a very simplified diagram, but material is being heated further into the interior, rising up and cooling, and then since it's cooling, it falls back down, then gets heat back up, and it rises, it cools, and falls back down. With this whole convection process going. But I mentioned earlier, what is specifically going on in the interior of the sun, down to minute details, still very not understood, right? The overall picture, is pretty well understood, but the exact details is very difficult to actually model, and we're still working on that. However, we have come up with techniques to, in a way, observe the interior of the sun. And it turns out that one of those ways, at least, is pretty similar to what we did when we were observing the interior of the Earth. So in that process, we call it seismology, and we use vibrations that travel through the Earth and understanding that you know these vibrations create waves. The ways that a wave will travel changes depending on the kind of material it travels through. So by looking at how the vibrations travel through the Earth, we can come up with sort of at least a rough map of sort of the structure of the interior. In a similar way, it was noticed not that long ago that there are portions of the sun's surface, or generally speaking, all over the sun's surface, Portions of it are sort of rising and falling. Right? It's almost like your uh, chest when you breathe. Breathe in, it rises up, breathe out, it falls down. It turns out that all over the sun, portions of its surface are sort of rising and falling. Like that. And from observing all of those and measuring the differences and how fast they rise and how fast they fall, we actually get an idea of sort of what's happening beneath those rising and fallings. Right? Again, it's like waves that are traveling through the interior, and when they reach the surface, they'll have gone through all this different material, and they'll kind of bring along with them a little bit of information of the stuff they travel through. I expect it's a rather difficult thing. It's still kind of a rough uh, way of observing, but it is a way of observing the interior of the sun. So being like seismology, it's been dubbed helioseismology, or seismology of the sun. And just to note, maybe then, from those observations, we've been able to say things fairly concretely, like the amount of helium on the surface that we can see on the surface, or like the relative amount of helium to hydrogen on the surface, remains pretty similar throughout the convection zone, right? Not necessarily in the core, but pretty much throughout the convection zone, that ratio is pretty similar. So the last thing I wanted to mention, I said we'd get back to talking about neutrinos a little bit at least. If we think about what I told you earlier, where a neutrino that gets created in the interior of the sun zooms out and pretty much never touches anything. Straight out in a couple of seconds. One of the reasons that we don't have a good idea or a good way to observe the interior of the sun is because photons that are created inside that we would normally observe, right? We collect the photons do spectroscopy, look at their wavelengths, look at the temperature. Those things you would normally do depend on the fact that a photon came directly from its source. In the interior of the sun, as I showed you, those photons, those gamma rays that are getting created, bounce around a ton, right? They lose energy as they're going, their direction, have no idea where they came from exactly, right? So all that bouncing around basically just wipes out any information we might get from that photon when it eventually reaches us as, like, visible light. Neutrinos, however, come basically straight from the core. 
So they're able to carry information directly to us from what's happening in the core of the star. However, the same reason that it comes straight out of the center of the sun makes it very difficult to work with. Like I said, it is incredibly weakly interacting. It doesn't really hardly want to interact with anything at all. So this is a very tough thing to do to measure the neutrinos coming from the sun. However, shown here is a very high payoff, right? They bring information directly from the core of the sun or from all stars, whatever star you want. Give you an idea of how many neutrinos there are, well, at least coming from the sun, the ones that are being generated in the sun, and they make it to Earth, right? You look at like your pinky nail. Your pinky nail is about the size of a square centimeter, and you hold it upright or towards the sun, there's about 60 billion neutrinos, billion with a B, passing through your pinky nail every second. Mind-boggling amount of things passing through you all the time, but almost none of them are ever doing anything. Right? They're going through without touching the thing, without interacting with it. That has not deterred scientists and physicists from trying to measure them anyway. Right? So we build these enormous detectors to try to have enough material so that a neutrino might interact with them, cause something to happen. If that something happens, we can try to then detect it. So the pictures down here on the right is the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory called SNOW. This is the detector, it's this huge sphere. The one on the left is Super Kamiokande, um, that one's in Japan, Snow is in Canada. The Super Kamiokande, or Super K, is also just this like huge vat, huge uh, container, and both of them actually work on the same principle. They're filled with the liquid. I think both of them use a type of water. Snow uses what's known as heavy water. So Snow uses uh, a thousand metric tons of heavy water as sort of the target to try to get neutrinos to smash into that, uh, that heavy water. Uh, Super K, I think, uses some other, some type of water, I'm not sure exactly, right? But it's just a bunch of it. And once a neutrino hits something in there, it might cause a little bit of something, and then you try to detect that. But it's like trillions and trillions of neutrinos going through volumes this size, and maybe you get one neutrino in action like a day. Very tough, but it's being done. Alright, well that's all I got for the workings of the inside of the sun, our local star. I believe that is the end of this part of the course. So it's going to be an exam soon. And after that, we're going to sort of move out of our solar system and start talking about stars in general. We'll talk about stars a good bit because that is mostly what makes the universe go around. Until then.